This morning, we're going to be talking about a subject that all of us are confronted with, and it's temptation. And temptation doesn't escape anybody. It's all around us. We've got to learn how to deal with it. Tonight we'll be talking about some more specifics. We're going to be talking about the works of the flesh that are mentioned over in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Somebody may oh, we don't want to talk about that. That's, that's not pleasant to talk about. It's not. But all Scripture is profitable. And there is profit in studying about that because the Bible says those things can keep you out of heaven. So don't stay away because of the subject. And we hope you'll be here at that time at 6 tonight as we talk about that. We mentioned that temptation comes the way of every person. Our flesh is the great battleground on which that uh, takes place. That's where it's fought. And we're fighting against the tempter. In the book of Ephesians, the Bible gives us all of the Christian's armor. It's there for a reason. It's to help protect us from the devil, from temptation and evil. We talked about looking at things from a biblical standpoint last week as we see things going on in the world. School shootings, mass shootings, and things like that. That biblically, the devil is behind all of that. And people fall for his lies. And so when we look at the Christian's armor, we see that everything's taken care of. And the only piece of armor the Lord didn't give is something for the back. The Lord didn't intend for us to turn our backs. Satan appeals to us along three avenues. We memorize those when we're small children. We may not fully understand them then, but later on we come to And that's the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And we're to do the will of the Father, and the Bible tells us that the Lord will take care of us if we do that. And that seems to always be his approach. One of those three and sometimes all three of those. We see all three of them in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 1. And uh, Genesis chapter 3 rather. And uh, what happened there concerning Adam and Eve. And that's unfortunate that it's that way. But uh, they submitted to the temptation and many of us have ever since then. Verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And then we see Satan working his craftiness and reasoning with her and finally getting her to do what he wants her to do. And verse 6 tells us, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desired to make one wise, she took the fruit and ate, and she gave also unto her husband to her, and he did eat. And we see all three of those avenues there. She saw that the tree was good for food. There's the lust of the flesh. She saw that it was pleasant to look upon. There's the lust of the eyes. And then a tree to make one wise. There's the pride of life. You're going to be like God. You're going to know some things that you don't presently know. And it's along some of those same lines that the devil came to David when he was confronted with Bathsheba. There was the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh there. This is how he came to Jesus in Matthew 4 when Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And he presented all these things to him. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 4.15 that Jesus was tempted in every way there is to be tempted at all points like we are. So everything you can imagine, Jesus was confronted. And if not more so, because Jesus was tempted to do some things that We can't even do. I can't turn stones into bread. And if you've gone for 40 days fasting, no food, that would be a great temptation if you had the ability to do that. And Jesus had the ability to do that, but he didn't give in to the temptation. So all men are engaged in this war within the flesh. And James chapter 4, which you heard, or James chapter 1, you heard read this morning. 
uh, the Bible says that a man, each man is drawn away by his own lust and is enticed. He's tempted and it brings forth death when he gives into the sin. And there are none who are not tempted. It's common to man, the Bible says. In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, but the Lord has provided a way of escape in time of temptation. We don't always look for that way of escape. The Lord hadn't promised it will always be the easiest course to follow, but he promises us that it's always there, and we need to look for it. And furthermore, there are none who haven't been severely wounded in that engagement. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we're told at least a couple of more times that everybody sins. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 20, for there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. You've got almost an identical statement over in 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 46 that there is no man that doeth good and doesn't sin. Spiritual death was the result of giving in to temptation, yielding to it. And yet the Bible says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And we know all of us are going to die physically, but the Bible is talking about spiritual death. That's the worst kind of death. The word death means separation. When you die physically, your body and spirit are separated. We're told that in James 2, 26. The body, apart from the spirit, is dead. Well, when we're separated from God, that's spiritual death. That's the worst kind. It's for keeps. And we don't want to be separated from God for, for keeps at the end of time. So we need a Savior, and we need him badly. And the Bible tells us about that need. And the conflict doesn't end even when we obey the gospel, even when we've been redeemed. The conflict is still there, but we've still got a lot going for us then. We've got the Lord and talking with him in prayer. We've got fellow Christians to encourage us and lift us up. And we've got the Lord willing to, forbid it, for, to forgive us. We've got the scriptures. And a lot of times people don't think about that, but we've got a lot going for us. So the Christian is severely tried by the devil. And we're warned about his wiles and his craftiness. He goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And we're not to give place to him, it says in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. And so Jesus was a righteous man, and yet he was tempted. He was tempted. He left us an example of how to resist temptation. And he did that primarily in two ways. He did it by quoting scripture, as he did in Matthew 4. And when he was tempted, that was in the wilderness. When he was tempted in the Garden of Gethsemane, he did it by praying. So always remember that scripture and prayer are two things that the devil can't stand. And we've got those right there at the tip of our fingers. We've got them available for us. That's how Jesus resisted temptation. Scripture and prayer, but you've got to know the scriptures. And that's why we come together and study the Bible on a regular basis, so that we can know how to resist those temptations. Jesus had the best answer. And did you know what happened after that third time Jesus quoted scripture? The devil left. He doesn't like scripture. Unless he can pervert it, and he tried to do it on that occasion, and it didn't work. So we need to remember that. So the question, how do I resist temptation, is a question that we need to raise and we need to look at. The Bible tells us that sin is lawlessness. It's without law on its behalf. It's iniquity. First Corinthians 10 and verse 12, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So there's that problem of pride there. And there is a way of escaping temptation. The Lord has promised it will be there. And he commands us to resist it and to sin not. 1 John chapter 2 and uh, in, in verse 1, we might notice what the Lord said there. And he calls us little children there. My little children, these things write I unto you that you may not sin. But then he goes ahead to say in the rest of the verse, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So we're commanded not to sin, but if we do, there's a safety net, but you've got to look for it. You've got to be sure. 
And that's Jesus Christ, the advocate we have. We've got somebody who is advocating on our behalf, but we've got to talk to him. When a person goes on trial, you need to talk to your lawyer. You need to do that. You need to communicate. Well, Christ is our advocate. He's there for us, and he commands us to do that. Now, what we want to learn is how to resist temptation and sin not, as he says in that verse. And I believe some have given in to the notion that it is simply inevitable in our lives that we are going to sin. And I'm not saying that we're going to be perfectly sinless. The Bible tells us that nobody is. But I'm talking about the idea that we have to sin. And a lot of times people excuse that. Well, I'm, I'm only human. I'm only human. Think about that. There's a Calvinistic doctrine that says we have to sin because we are only human. Well, if that's the case, then whose fault is it? We didn't make ourselves. Someone else made us. So whose fault is it if we have to sin? That puts the blame on God, doesn't it? God created us. He made us human. He created us in his image, and he gave us our bodies while we're here on the earth. And while it's true that we are only human, does it follow that this is the reason why we sin? Because we're human. I don't believe it does. If we sin because we're only human, I wonder if the angels said that. The Bible tells us that angels sinned in 2 Peter 2 and verse 4. Did they say, well, we're only angels. We had to sin. We're only angels. Who's that put the blame on? Well, God made the angels. So maybe we need to rethink this. Uh, men do sin, but it's not because we're only human. And it wasn't because they were only angels that they sinned. And to suggest that we sin because we're only human is to accuse God of making us sin because he's the one that made us. We didn't make ourselves. So why do we sin? Well, very simply, we sin because we choose to. Sin is a choice, and it's a result of making the wrong choice, not of having no choice. We're not robots without choice. We're not computers that have been programmed. We have freedom of choice. And God opened himself to a lot of heartache when he gave us that freedom. But I think most of us would prefer that to being robots. And so if it's not by choice, then the only other thing we can say is God's to blame. Those are only two possibilities. Either we choose to sin or God makes us because we're only human. And there's been a lot of talk about this, whether man has to sin. No, man doesn't have to. He doesn't have to. Man's not made with a built-in mechanism that says, it's time for your daily sin. You've got to go do it. That's not the case. So what is it then? Well, as we've mentioned, it's a result of making choices, and it's a result of not looking for the way of escape. And it's a result of several other things, putting ourselves in the wrong place. We're going to look at some of those things, and we can stop the pattern if we want to. But first of all, we want to notice how we can resist temptation, and that's to remember that the devil can be resisted. James 4 and verse 7, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Jesus resisted the devil, and guess what happened? The devil fled. So we not only are told that that's what the devil will do, we have an example of it happening. It happened to Jesus. The devil fled. And we're told that same thing will happen to us. How do you do it? Scripture and prayer. That's how the Lord did it, and that's how we'll do it if we're going to be successful with it. So the devil is not an evil God. He's not God in the sense of deity. I know he's called the God of this world, but he's not all-powerful. He's not omniscient. He's not all-knowing. He's not omnipotent. He's not all-powerful. And he certainly is not uh, omnipresent. He can flee. And he's not an eternal being. He, he will exist eternally, but not in the situation that he's in now. There's a place prepared for him, and we don't want to go there. And so we remember the devil can be resisted. And his devices are not secret. It would be terrible if we didn't have any idea how the devil works. 
But the Lord has told us just about everything we need to know about the devil. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, a couple of places, 2 Corinthians rather, we want to notice some of the things that the Lord, that uh, we're told about the devil. In chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians, and in verse 11, chapter 2, verse 11 tells us that no advantage may be gained over us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his devices. If we don't know about the devices of the devil, it's not because we haven't been told what they are. Paul said we're not ignorant of his devices. Now, if we were, then we might be able to plead ignorance, but we know how the devil works. The Bible tells us how he works, and it's not like men would normally think. Let's look at the, in the same book, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15. Verse 13 says, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, fashioning themselves as apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for even Satan fashions himself as an angel of light. So don't th expect him to come with a pitchfork and horns and a tail. I know we often depict him. I've even depicted him like that. That's really not the way he looks. <laughs> He's going to be pleasant. He may be handsome. He may be beautiful. He may be attractive. All of those things. It's no great thing, therefore, if his ministers also fashion themselves as ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. So he's crafty. He goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, but the Lord has kind of put him in a cage. He's overtaken the strong man. And only if you go into his territory are you in danger. That's why he can be resisted. Now, if he was just running loose, that'd be one thing. But the Lord, the Lord has taken care of that. So one of the first things we need to remember is that Satan can re be resisted. A second thing I need to remember is to reflect upon the offering of Jesus. And when we think about all the offering of Jesus and all that he did for us, then we can't afford to miss that. Think about what the Lord did for us. Think about what he did on the cross. Think about what he endured in his lifetime. And all of those things, of course, tell us how much the Lord loved us. He didn't have to do any of that. We think about the torture that he went through. You've probably seen that in, depicted in movies. We probably never have really seen it depicted like it really was and the horror that it really was. But it was terrible. Just reading what the Bible tells us that he went through is one of those things. And you can read about that in Matthew chapter 26. But also as we think about this, let's consider that I need to remember that I am created in the image of God. We're told that in Genesis 1 and verse 26. What does that imply? Well, an image is a representation of the God of heaven. Our spirits are created in his image, the Bible tells us. We are the representation of God. And so my nature is not corrupt. The Bible says God made man upright. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 9, 29, but he has sought out many inventions. So God made man upright. Everything God made was good. He didn't make us evil. Everything he made was good. And on the last day of the creation, it uses the word, words very good. It was very good. So that's one of the things we need to remember also. And so God's will is not mine beyond my ability to do it. We're told that we can understand it. Be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Ephesians 5 and verse 17. In Ephesians 3 and verse 4, Paul says, When you read what I wrote, you can understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So we can know it. We can understand it. Jesus prayed on the night before his betrayal, sanctify them through the truth. Thy word is truth. Well, if we can be sanctified by the truth and it can be known and it can be obeyed and we can apply it to our lives, we can do it. And the issue is will we do it? Will we do it? Another thing is that we need to recall scriptures related to whatever particular temptation is confronting us at the time. So that means we need to know the scriptures pretty well, don't we? 
You don't get that just by coming to Sunday school. You get some of that, but you're only getting about 45 minutes of it at the most. You're not getting as much as you need. And so we need to avail ourselves of all the classes. We need to take time at home to study our Bibles, get our Bible lessons, work on particular weaknesses that we know we have, and learn about scriptures that talk about those things. That's what we saw in the example of Jesus. Jesus had an appropriate scripture for everything the devil confronted him with. And if we know the scriptures, we can do the same thing. So Jesus is my example in temptation. He's your example as well. We're told that in 1 Peter 2, verses 21 and 22. And his methods are tried and proven and successful. We can see that in Matthew chapter 4. So the secret to this success is Bible study. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. And we're told over and over the value of learning the word. So the secret is Bible study. And Bible study eliminates ignorance. And ignorance is often what gets us into trouble. And we don't need to do that. So Bible study gains for us wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's where wisdom starts. If you're starting some other place, you're starting at the wrong place. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and we need to understand that. And Proverbs and Ecclesiastes both teach us that. The Psalms teach us that. And Bible study builds character. The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing of the, and the dividing asunder of both soul and spirit and joints and marrow and quick to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart for there is no creature that is not manifest in his sight. For all things are na la naked and laid open before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So the scriptures are powerful. And we don't need to underestimate that power. Scriptures relate to common temptations. Make a list of the verses that apply to your besetting sin. And commit them to memory because you're going to need them. You're going to need those. Each person has his own set of strengths and weaknesses. What may be your strength may not be mine. What may be your weakness may not be mine. Mine may be different than yours. We all know what they are. We need to learn those scriptures. And so we re need to reflect on that and make purposeful application to them in our daily lives, daily existence. We mentioned a while ago reflecting on the offering of Jesus. We remember him at the Last Supper. Remember know what the Bible says about Jesus at the Last Supper? Have you ever noticed this in John chapter 13 and verse 1? Have you ever noticed this? Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own that were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Did you ever notice that? Unto the end. That's how much he loved us. And that's why he went to the cross. That's why we need to do our best to go to heaven and to be there. And so we need to remember him, Gethsemane. We need to remember him when he was on trial. We need to remember him on the cross. All of that. But then there's something else we can do. We can pray for deliverance. In fact, in the model prayer that Jesus taught his apostles, taught them to pray to deliver us from evil. Well, will the Lord do that? Well, he wouldn't have told us to pray for it if he won't. So if we really want to get out of an evil situation, we can pray and the Lord will help us. And then we have to do our part. So when Jesus was tempted, he did pray for that. And he taught us to pray for deliverance. And we need that. God will answer your prayers. And then also, I need to reevaluate my pattern of life. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 10 is a warning about evil companions. In fact, it kind of is always relevant. It's warning about joining a gang is what it is. How relevant is that to 2018, the danger of joining a gang? Well, let's look at it in Proverbs 1 and verse 10. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. And then he goes on to tell about what they're going to say and how they're going to entice you to join in with them. 
and to do the things they're doing. So I need to reevaluate that. And temptations often because, because, come because we are not circumspect, we are not wise to the situation and those surrounding us. In other words, we're with the wrong people. We're not with people that are going to help us go to heaven. We ought to choose, as our closest companions, people that are going to help us go to heaven. That starts with marriage. We ought to choose somebody that's going to help us go to heaven. That ought to be our first question. Not whether he's handsome or she's pretty. I know those things figure in. They're on the list. But will this person help me go to heaven? That ought to be the first question. And then go from there. So, we're often with the wrong people. We're often watching the wrong things. Job said he wouldn't look on a maiden. He knew that would be the wrong thing to do. We have our priorities out of order. Seek first the kingdom, Jesus said. And we're not where we ought to be. That's what David was doing when he was wandering around on the housetop. Led to his sin with Bathsheba in 2, Corinthians, 2 Samuel 11. And so Jesus taught us to watch and pray. We sing about that, watch and pray. And some start praying after they've run in and embraced temptation. Not wrong to pray then, but it'd be better off if we did it before. But we don't always do that. And so there's some Bible examples of watchfulness. We see Joseph who fled from Potiphar's wife. And we see Timothy being told to flee fornication. We see the Corinthians admonished to do that. Timothy uh, fled the youthful passions and all that. And the Romans were admonished to do that, to make no provision for the flesh, we're told in that passage, to fulfill the lust thereof. So much trouble because we don't, because, because we don't break off those associations that are leading us downward, activities and entertainments that give rise to temptation. So what does that mean? Well, look at what we've just learned. Temptation and the common experience of man is that it need not result in sin. We don't need to say, I'm only human, because that's not the right answer. That's not the reason why people sin. It's because of choice. So we must face it, and we must resist it. And here's how we do it. Remember that Satan can be resisted. We reflect upon the offering of Jesus. We remember that we are men, human beings, created in God's image. We recall scriptures related to particular weaknesses we have. We pray for deliverance, and we reevaluate re our pattern of life. And there may be some things we need to change that keep getting us into trouble and keep falling back into sin. Maybe there's a situation that we've let go on too long. We need to change that. This morning, if you're not a child of God, you can change that. It's a choice. The Lord has done everything he can do without taking away your freedom of choice to encourage you to make the right choice. He's offered all kinds of incentives and motives for you to be a Christian. Things just go better, and they'll go better in eternity if we do it the Lord's way. If you haven't repented and been baptized into Christ, that's what you need to do first. To become a Christian, it's the most important decision you'll ever make in life, it is the most intelligent decision you'll ever make in life. You'll never decide anything more important than that. And that's to become a Christian. And we hope you'll do that today. If you haven't done that, if you have done that in the past and you haven't been living according to the way you pledged that you would do when you became a Christian, the Lord will forgive you if you'll ask him to. If it's something of a public nature, then certainly you ought to acknowledge it in that way. But if it's of a private nature, you can take care of it right where you are. But take care of it while you have time and opportunity. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, will you please come as we stand and sing the hymn that Brother Zane has selected?